Okay, so here's an example of uh, a panic which we recently saw. So we'll just see what it is to actually do postmortem analysis. So as the first uh, line says, it's a panic. And it says, what is the thread, the address of the thread which panicked? So what kind of a panic is it? It's a bad trap. So what do we mean by a bad trap? Basically, we are trying to access a memory location which is an invalid uh, memory address. So we're trying to load from a memory address which is not at all mapped. So that results in a bad trap. So basically, we get a MMU miss exception. Uh, it says what type of trap it is. So we don't care about that so much right now. We have this uh, register pointer. So that's a area of kernel memory which contains the registers which were there at the time of the panic. And then what is the faulting address? So then we go ahead and look at what the panic stack is. So we take the thread address, do a fine stack on it. We see that, OK, it's called, it's uh, using the, it's in the CPC module, which is the uh, CPU performance counters module. Okay, so we then want to take a look at the instruction which caused the bat, bat trap. So we took the register pointer, we dumped the registers. So you have uh, RPC, which is the actual program counter value which caused the system to go down. So we look at what that instruction is. It's a LD stub instruction, which is load and store one byte. It's a comp uh, read, modify, write instruction. And uh, it's trying to uh, read and write at the address pointed to by the register O0. So notice that O0 has a very strange value. It's feed face, feed face. So when we try to access that memory location, it basically caused the panic. Down arrow, right? OK. So now we look at what the C code corresponding to that particular uh, stack is. So it's basically the KCPC bind thread is a function in the kernel. And we have a mute, mutex enter call in that particular function. So we are passing the address of the mutex. So it hap the uh, mutex is actually part of the uh, one of the data structures which is hanging off the thread. So we take the uh, thread address, get the actual data structure, which is the TCPC set. Then we print the uh, TCPC set. We see that uh, the mutex is at an offset 0x28. OK, so we take uh, the address of that structure, which is uh, 6DE40, we add 28. We figure out what is the contents of that particular data location. So if you look at the stack, you see that the mutex vector enter is a call in the kernel which saying that, OK, I want to acquire this mutex, but the mutex is currently owned by somebody else. So I need to go block myself. So in order to block myself, I'm going to call turnstile block, which is another function in the kernel. And the turnstile block requires uh, to take the uh, dispatcher lock of the thread, which is, being, uh, which is the owner of the current uh, current of the mutex so we find that the owner of the mutex is basically this thread structure 30340 the one ending at the end and then we see what that guy's t underscore lock p points to that points to that 0x feed face on which we actually trapped so something is wrong here as in the lock pointer of that particular thread structure cannot be that nonsensical value. So let's go back and look at the buffer from which we obtained the uh, mutex owner. So notice there are two values which are highlighted at the dump of that buffer. So if we XOR the two values, we find that the pattern is ALLOCATD, which actually indicates that actually the buffer is allocated. So we figure out who allocated that buffer. So again, we are using a lot of features from the kernel memory allocator. This particular crash file was taken with KMMFLAX enabled. So we do a buff CTL audit to find out who actually allocated the buffer. So the buffer was allocated by, I guess some people might have read this stuff again, uh, by a thread, by our panic thread only. You have the thread ID. And the following the thread uh, uh, value is the cache value. So this is telling us from which particular kernel memory cache this particular buffer came from. So the buffer came from a 
cache which allocated only 32 byte buffers. But if you look at uh, the access of that buffer, we were accessing the 40th member of that particular buffer. So clearly we have oversized, we have a access to a, a field which is much beyond what we actually allocated for. So this turned out to be a case wherein the customer had an older version of the CPC driver and a newer kernel. And this caused a mismatch in the structures and this resulted in a panic. Right, so here actually nobody is at fault except the fact that okay, you, you mixed, and maxed, mixed and matched two different versions of software and that resulted in a behavior which is totally undesirable. So the bug was okay, there is no bug, you just upgrade the driver to the latest version and the problem is solved anyway. Okay, so going on to live debugging. Uh, till now we saw post-mortem debug, so we have a crash file, we need to figure out what has happened. Live debugging is that way better in the sense we have a lot better tools. And when is it useful? It's useful when, let's say, the system is hanging, when the system is coming up, or it's like way early in the boot process wherein the dump device is not configured, so you really can't take a crash, crash file. So again, uh, what are the tools which we have available? We have the kernel debugger KMDB, so you can boot in KMDB, set breakpoints. So there are various ways to set uh, breakpoints, disable them, enable them, watch values in the kernel. Then uh, you also have a lot of P tools, uh, P stack, PS, uh, P flag, stuff like that. So all these are extremely useful when you're uh, using uh, live debugging. And of course, uh, trust and the numerous options it has are, I think people can spend a good amount of time reading that man page and still not figure out how to use trust well enough. Okay, so uh, D-Trace, Brendan Gregg is going to give a presentation on D-Trace two days from now, so I'm not going to spend much time about it except say that ever since this tool has come into existence, I think uh, uh, my job and a lot of support engineer job has become much, much easier because we, we can now ask questions, get real-time answers uh, from the systems as such and figure out where the problem could be. So the things which we find useful are the fact that you can trace every kernel function entry and return. So you can put probes wherever you want all through the kernel and uh, okay, lots of times the stacks which are leading to those kernel functions itself is a big eye-opener. So you wouldn't have thought, okay, this code could have got called in this way. So that itself is a big deal a uh, lot of times. And the f okay, a brief introduction, D, uh, D-Trace gives you the D language which allows you to uh, write uh, various actions and you can predicate on certain variables being true and stuff like that. It gives you a lot of powerful data management primitives like aggregations and quantizing, quantization. You have multiple providers. You have providers for every uh, important kernel subsystem like the scheduler, the proc, the I.O. So you can ask things, you can get information like, okay, which thread was on CPU? Whom did it give the CPU to when it did a context switch to? Uh, for what reason is it blocking? What is the stack which leads to that particular thread blocking? Every system call uh, is a probe point, so you can figure out what system calls are being done throughout the system, which system calls are failing throughout the system, something which trust cannot do because trust works on a particular process. So here you can work on a systemic basis and figure out, okay, what are the things which are failing on the system. You have various different consumers. The most common one is D-Trace. Logstat has been rewritten to be a D-Trace consumer. You can get interrupt statistics, what interrupts are coming on what CPUs. Then of course you have anonymous tracing, so you enable some uh, D scripts on the system and then you know that the system would panic. So you want the state of the system leading to the panic. So which is when you uh, use anonymous tracing. Or when the system is booting up and uh, you don't have any terminal associated, so that time you use anonymous tracing and you log all the uh, tracing information in, in kernel buffers and then you have MDBD commands to extract those uh, information. Okay. Okay, so we'll just uh, skip towards uh, kernel deadlocks. So what are deadlocks? 
you have a set of processes, each one waiting for one another. So they form a cycle. And as a result, uh, none of these processes or threads which are involved in the cycle make any forward progress. So eventually, the system gets stuck behind uh, some of these threads, and the system basically hangs up. So um, the most common uh, deadlocks are the ones which are uh, involving condition variables or semaphores. So you have two threads, each one waiting for on some condition variable, which would probably be signaled by the other thread. So, the, so you have two threads, three thread, four thread, uh, four-way deadlocks. Then you have deadlocks due to uh, memory, uh, basically research crunch, physical memory ex exhaustion, or your counting sum of four is undersized. So you said my counting sum of four, I have initialized it to 15. That means I can maximum do 15 sum apps, and then hopefully one of those guys will do a sum of v, and then the, uh, the system would progress. But then that 15 turned out to be very small because for whatever reason. So you need to end up increasing that or maybe use some other uh, synchronization primitive to overcome those problems. Then you have other miscellaneous deadlocks which are like between the file system and the virtual memory uh, interaction. You have self deadlocks. So w this thread took a, took a particular mutex or a read-write enter, did some various activities and comes back and wants to take the same mutex read-write enter lock. So it, it's basically wanting to take a lock which it's, it itself has to release before this is, uh, it can make pro uh, forward progress. So how are uh, deadlocks detected? Uh, people with the OS background would remember about banker's algorithm when you figure out whether allocating a particular resource to this thread would lead to an uh, unsafe situation or something like that. But it turns out that banker's algorithm is cannot be implemented in practice because you wouldn't know beforehand what those what this thread is going to uh, look for in future as in what are the locks it might require in the future so uh, solaris does not implement the banker's algorithm neither do any other os as far as i know but uh, we could detect deadlocks whenever a, a mutex access or a redirect uh, lock access is uh, being made uh, not access or the request to take that uh, mutex or the read-write lock is being made. Uh, so in so open solaris, what do we do? Uh, we can detect deadlocks which involve the mutexes and the read-write locks. And uh, we just decide to panic because uh, we detect that th this is going to cause a deadlock. So the best thing is to basically uh, take the system down because uh, otherwise anyway it would hang up or it would cause uh, other catastrophic failures. So earlier did you detect, you just go ahead and panic the box. The next one is, uh, how do we detect uh, deadlocks in open source, as in what do we do? So recall about uh, priority inheritance. So you want T1 is waiting for a, a synchronization object which is held by T2, which is waiting for a synchronization object which is held by T3. And their priorities are 10, 30, 20, 10. So T1 needs to, will its priority to T2 figure out what T2 is waiting for try to will its priority to the guy who is blocking T2. So since anyway we are walking this chain of uh, owners, we, we can actually figure out that, okay, are we uh, trying to will the priority back to ourselves at some point? So uh, do we detect a cycle? If we detect a cycle, we know that it's a deadlock and we decide to panic. So that code is extremely neat, uh, which tries to detect this uh, deadlock. So I'll just put a URL to that particular uh, source code location. Going forward, uh, the, so this is the example of a deadlock wherein uh, open, uh, the system detected that this would cause us a deadlock, so it says cycle in blocking chain and it panics. Right. So going forward, how do you analyze and trigger deadlocks? You basically look at the crash file, figure out the threads which are involved. Uh, in causing the deadlock. So the key question is to figure out who holds what mutexes or what pre deadlocks and wants what. So that way you discover the deadlock and then once you know the deadlock uh, has happened, you then figure out how to trigger the deadlock by writing simple scripts or simple C programs. In most cases, uh, a couple of while loops are good enough to trigger the deadlock, but in some cases you might need to write a small device driver to 
exercise the particular kernel code fragment repeatedly. So going forward. So these are the examples of various deadlocks. So here there's a deadlock between the file system and the virtual memory. So the thread on the left, thread one is uh, trying to do a direct IO read. So direct IO is basically a mechanism wherein you can read from the uh, file on the uh, device into your application buffer without involving the uh, kernel caching. So there's a component called segmap which does not get involved when you do this direct IO read. So in this case, uh, the thread on the left is actually trying to do a direct IO read. It figures out that actually the file is there in the cache. So it needs to invalidate the cache. So to invalidate the cache, it needs to take the page locks on each of the pages in the, of that file which is there in memory. So while trying to take that page locks of all the pages in the memory belonging to that file, it blocks on one of the pages, which happens to be, that page lock is, is, happens to be held by thread two. And thread two is, holds that particular page lock and wants the read write lock of the file which thread one is owning. So as a result, thread one is waiting for thread two and thread two is waiting for thread one. And such a deadlock is not detected automatically by uh, Solaris. Eventually, uh, some other thread three would come and wait on thread two, thread four would come on, th wait on thread one, so on and so forth, and eventually the system would hang up, and we, uh, at, at that point would take a crash file, and then based on looking at the crash file, you would detect that these two threads are involved in. Okay, so th this is another interesting deadlock involving AutoFS and DevFS. In fact, this was hit maybe a couple of months by a couple of customers. So it turns out that uh, most people don't have a slash misc in their root file system, right? Nobody would generally create, but this customer had created a slash misc in his root file system, and on top of it, he had made slash misc a AutoFS mount point. And when he had that, uh, with such a configuration, at some point, uh, there was a process which was doing find slash devices pseudo on the system and uh, you had auto mount D which was trying to open slash dev slash UDP which actually points to slash devices slash pseudo uh, uh, one of the modules there. So auto mount D is waiting for a read write lock which is held by the find thread. The find thread is trying to do a mod load of a particular uh, kernel module and, and so that find thread T2 is triggered T3 to actually load the mod module and T3 is a system thread which is in the process of trying to read slash plus slash spark in RSM ops which is the kernel module which it wants to load and it tries to contact the AutoFS daemon. So since the AutoFS daemon is stuck, you have uh, T1 waiting for T2, T2 waiting for T3 and T3 waiting for T1. So it's a three-way deadlock. So the workaround here was simple, basically uh, don't make slash misc your, uh, uh, your AutoFS mount point. Right? So the, these are deadlocks which probably you wouldn't figure out from the source code at all. It's only triggered on a particular customer system with his unique configuration. Uh, anyway, we, we did fix this in uh, Solaris, so you can still have slash misc as your auto at one point if you care to. <laughs> okay, so this is another uh, deadlock which is in, involving uh, uh, the kernel cage out. So I'll just keep the, because I'm running out of time really. Uh, this was a deadlock sit, uh, seen on uh, open Solaris systems when trying to boot uh, uh, guest, uh, guest uh, open Solaris 2009-06 as a guest on a Zen, Zen system. So again, a three-way deadlock, T1 waiting for T2, T2 waiting for T3, T3 and T3 waiting for T1. So how do you uh, solve deadlocks? In most cases, you can uh, define the lock order and say, look, this is the uh, order in which these locks have to be taken. But a lot of times it turns out that you actually can't enforce that rule uh, of lock ordering. You might still need to have cases wherein you need to take the locks in a reverse order. So in which case uh, you, you are liable to uh, be vulnerable for these uh, deadlock uh, problems. So one way to solve them is uh, instead of doing a blocking call, you do a try enter. Okay, can I try for this mutex? And if it is free, uh, you get ownership of that mutex or the read write lock. Otherwise, you release whatever locks you're holding and try the uh, uh, locking sequence again. But this can lead to live locks wherein a couple of CPUs are busy doing the same thing, each one expecting the other to release. And so you just 
change the problem from a deadlock to a live lock where instead of everything hanging, everything running, but no progress being made on the system. So, okay, what are race conditions? Races are basically two threads trying to access the same memory. At least one is writing, the other is reading. The outcome of the race is dependent on the sequence of access to the uh, memory locations. Again, races can be uh, catastrophic. They can cause system hangs, panics. Sometimes can lead to data corruption. We had a race in the UFS uh, code which led to uh, data corruption. They're extremely hard to reproduce. They occur under extreme load conditions, typically seen only on customer systems. It's very hard to reproduce on uh, our labs. But once you know uh, what the race is, and then you've figured out the code fragments, again, you exercise uh, some test code to uh, pound hard on the code fragments in question and then uh, shake out these bugs. The key point with races is the interleaved execution of the thread. So programmers generally think that, okay, this is the sequence of operations, this is the sequence of operations. They forget about the fact that these sequence of operations can be happening in parallel on multi-CPU machines. And the order and the interleaving of these sequences of executions generally uh, trigger these races. So, uh, Again, uh, you need to have good uh, analytical <laughs> skills to figure out the races. Sorry, okay. I really do have to. Okay. I think what else? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, one thing that I'm not sure whether you've got it on your references page is all the source for all this low-level stuff about scheduling is actually available on OpenSolaris.org, um, for at least OpenSolaris, and kernel.org for Linux and FreeBSD.org, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you are at all interested in this and you, or you think you've come across an instance of something like this, go and look at the source um, and ask lots of questions. <laughs> right. Uh, so we're okay. going to have a uh, break for lunch. Uh, lunch is just outside where morning tea was. Um, we have a little bit of a sort of a demo room with some, uh, some kit and some sun rays and some virtual machines running. Uh, also just showing off some of what we make. Um, and we've got...